a young man and a young woman got married. And those first few weeks and months were absolutely wonderful. Everything that each of them did just delighted the other. In fact, the husband loved his wife so much that even the sound of her brushing her teeth gave him goosebumps and chills. He loved everything about her. And she loved everything about him. And then one day, as they're sitting at the dinner table, the wife realized that the way her husband, the one she loves, the way he chews his food is so distracting to her and so bothersome to her that she had to stop what she was doing. And she looked and she said, I don't even know who you are anymore. Why are we married? At that moment, the honeymoon was over. All of us probably have had some kind of an experience like that where we realized the honeymoon's over. Maybe it's the job that we absolutely prepared for and trained for and we're just excited to get. And then we realize about three months or six months in, man, this really stinks. This is work and I don't really like it, but I have to keep doing it. Maybe it was a school that we couldn't wait to attend or we couldn't wait to be a part of. And the reality of the difficulty of that coursework set in. Maybe it's a sport we play. Regardless, all of us have moments in our lives, in our relationships, in our workplace, with our families, when reality sets in, the honeymoon is over. And we know that something is going to have to change in us in order to keep going forward. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, Easter Sunday, is not just an event. It's not just a day. It's not just a moment in time where we say, wow, this is wonderful, and we buy new clothes, and we gather together. It's more than that. Now, churches have gone to great lengths to do a little extra for today, and we should, right? It's what we're supposed to do. But we realize that with Jesus and the resurrection, it's not an event. It's not just a day. It's a whole new reality. It's a whole new way of life. Everything has changed. And at some moment in our lives, that reality, it sets in. It sets into us. And we have to decide what we're going to do with it. That's what I feel the gospel story of the empty tomb says to us today. That reality has set in and now something has to change. Life will be different. And so I want to look at that for a few minutes. This passage teaches me several things. One of those being that the resurrection of Jesus Christ disrupts the way life is supposed to be. Jesus disrupts life. That tomb was supposed to be sealed. His body was supposed to be inside of it. And Mary goes and she finds out, my goodness, the tomb is empty. The stone has been rolled away. Where is Jesus? Jesus disrupts the way life is supposed to be. How is he disrupting your life? We look at what we go through in our lives and we look at what the life of faith means to us and we realize that there are times in our lives where disruption and change occurs. There's a teenager who spent their whole young adult life working on perfecting the art of a sport. Maybe it's basketball. Maybe She has spent countless hours working on the game of basketball. You know the dribbling drills. I tried to work on them with my son at one point in time. The shooting drills. The passing drills. She's gone to camps. She's gone to out-of-state tournaments. She spent her whole life perfecting the art of being an excellent basketball player. And she is. In fact, she's one of the best on her team. 
And she gets into a point of high school where there's scouts coming and looking and perhaps offering her, preparing to offer her a scholarship to school. Her and a couple of her teammates. And then one night, sort of randomly, in a, in a sort of random way, her, her best friend and the point guard of the team twists her knee and she blows out her knee. And in the hospital, she realizes this dream that I had is no longer reality. There's a new reality. A life of rehabbing your knee. You won't play sports again. Everything she's imagined her life would be, she begins to question. The resurrection of Jesus Christ does that for us. Everything that we imagine our lives to be, Jesus calls into question. It makes us think about where our priorities are in life. It makes us think about how we organize our life. It puts our dreams and our hopes into great perspective because we understand something. Jesus' resurrection disrupts life. He was supposed to be put to death and buried and forgotten about. But guess what? The tomb was empty. His body was not there. He had been raised. How is Jesus disrupting your life? The second thing I see from this reading is we have to see the reality of the resurrection for ourselves. Each of us in our own way, we have to see the reality of the resurrection for ourselves. Seeing is believing. Isn't that what they say? You have to see it. You have to be able to take that in and understand that. I look at the three people that are mentioned in this text. First, there's Mary Magdalene. She goes, she sees, she asks questions. She doesn't understand. She goes back and she tries to find answers from others. We look at Peter. And what is Peter? He's the person that jumps headfirst into everything. He goes straight into the tomb. He runs right in. He sees it. And, and he begins to think about what that means. And then he leaves. And then there's John, the one whom Jesus loved. The author of this text. And he takes his time he gets there, but he ponders, he thinks about it. All of us, we have to see that reality for ourselves. And some of us see it in different ways. Some of us have lots of questions about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some of us are more skeptical about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Could he have really been physically raised from the dead? Could this really have happened? Is the tomb Empty? Is it empty still? Can I go to Israel and actually see the tomb of Jesus? You actually can, in fact. But we have the questions. Some of us, we run straight into it. We accept it. We, we jump head first and then we fall down and we wonder what happens. And some of us, we don't like to take chances or risks. We have to think about it for ourselves a little bit. We all have to see the re reality of the resurrection for ourselves and each of us we see it in our own way nothing I say to you will make you understand and believe you have to accept that for yourself in your way and in your time and I see that playing out over and over again in scripture and in life and finally here's really what it comes down to you have to decide what you're going to do with this new reality. Notice something. The text says. When John went in, he saw and believed. He still did not understand that Jesus had to rise from the dead. But what does it say? He saw and he believed. The burden is always going to be on us. To figure out what we do. Jesus does his part, right? Right? Jesus did his part. He came to earth in the form of man. God with us. He lived among us and healed everyone that came to him. There's not one person in Scripture 
They came to Jesus and he said, sorry, I can't help you. Not one. He helped every single person who came and everybody saw it. It drew multitudes of people so much. So many people, so many crowds that it caused the attention of the Roman government to fall upon this man from a peasant village called Nazareth to say, who is this Jesus? He stood before a Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Because of all the attention he garnered, because of all of the miracles and the gifts that he gave. Jesus did this. And they accused him of everything humanly possible, most of which they couldn't even figure out what they were saying. They couldn't agree upon what they're saying. They accused him of everything humanly possible. And he stood there quietly and didn't deny anything that they said. He took it all. All of the lies, all of the insults, all of the injury, all of the hate. He took it all. And then they decided that they would, they would beat him for these crimes, these accused crimes and actions. So they took him out and the people that heard what Pontius Pilate ordered, they misunderstood the orders and they flogged him to the point of death. They literally meant to flog Jesus to death there on that stone in the praetorium. They had meant to flog him to death, says the word, but he didn't die. So they put a robe and a crown of thorns on his head and sent him back to Pilate, whom said, what? Let the people decide. And they shouted, crucify. And so they crucified him. Making him carry his own cross after being flogged to the point of death. He carries the cross on his back and he falls and they make someone else pick it up and and go with him to the place of crucifixion. They hang him on the cross. They argue over what they're going to put above his head. The king of the Jews. No, he only said he was the king of Jews. No, let's scratch it. No, the king of the Jews. At the cross, he's mocked and laughed at. They take his clothes and they gamble over who can have his clothing while he's naked on the cross. His own family is barely allowed to see him. But they make their way, his mother makes her way to the foot of the cross. And at the foot of the cross, Jesus tells John, the one who writes this, son, your mother, mother, your son, is a way of saying, I'm dying and now you're going to have to take care of her. It mentions none of his other family being there, including his brother's. And then Jesus dies on the cross. And they bury him. He doesn't have a grave. He's buried in a borrowed tomb. And he's sealed up. And guards are placed at the tomb to make sure nothing happens. And then what happens? Well, that's why we're here today. What else does Jesus have to do? What else does the Son of God have to do for you, for me, for us? He did his part. He did everything God asked him to do. And now the decision is up to us. What will we do with what we have heard about, witnessed, seen, felt, experienced, and we say we believe in? What will we do? I would love to stand here today and and pump you up and give you motivation to go out and to to have the best marriage ever and to have the best family life ever and and your business be successful and and give you all of these words. It's going to make life perfect for you. I would love to be that motivational speaker today, but I would be lying to you 
if I did that on this day. I would be misleading you and misusing this opportunity. Because here's what I want for all of you today. I want you to leave this place and I want you to be changed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want you to know what God did for you through His Son, Jesus. I want that to sink in and settle into every piece of who you are. I want you to think about that and talk about that with your family and pray about that and and ponder that in the road, driving to to wherever you're going and, and listening to the radio and being overcome by this understanding of who Jesus is. I want that to be in the back of your mind when you begin arguing with your loved ones. I want the resurrection of Jesus Christ to be in your mind and in your heart and throughout your entire being. Because here's what I know. Only the resurrection of Jesus Christ and accepting that will save us. And only receiving the fullness of that will change us. That's the reality that needs to set in. And something else I know. If the resurrection of Jesus is able to to sink in and settle in. All the other stuff will take care of itself. It sure will. There'll be nothing left undone. Because God leaves nothing undone. He says it is finished. And it is. The tomb was empty. And it still is. Jesus was raised from the dead. And He is alive forever and ever. Today, yesterday, forever. And that's reality. And that's when it sets in. We understand. And we believe. Amen.